you know, the whole the pun. Say again, go on. No, I had forgotten to start the recording, and then I saw the thing that I had permission to record. So the recording has oh, no. just started now. Sorry about that. Okay. So we have we have been talking about true rest and going over the um, definition of true rest, um, and how. So that's just for the recording. Um, because there are other forums on true rest. Um, and a, a couple of sort of ways you can see the power of true rest is if someone gets into something that really worked for them, they think the whole world would be better. At times they can even become sort of opin opinionated about it. The whole world would be better if um, everyone meditated or everyone jogged or whatever. Um, but it's prescriptive, something that works for someone, won't work for somebody else. Um, you, know, you could almost say that almost any human activity, there's someone in the world who gets true rest from it. It's, you know, it's that varied. And I think the varied nature of true rest makes it such a powerful tool and says something about David Pellin's originality, okay? Because other people come out with, you know, meditation or mindfulness, so everyone should go down that path, or, or that's the best path. And, and David Pellin, who pushed meditation and meditated himself, um, you know, is saying it's different, it's different for everybody. And that's very, that's very powerful for someone who came up with a, a school of thought and practice and isn't saying it, doing it my way, is saying you need to find your way to do it. And I think that's a good definition of tools. You know, you, you need to find your way to use these tools. And I think, you know, just staying on that for a moment um that's a good way to express the universality of the Pelham tools, which is my claim. Um, it's not the claim that everyone will like them or it'll work, they'll work for everyone. Um, because we don't all go on the same holidays, we don't all listen to the same music. Uh, some people won't like Pellin, then that's fine. Um, doesn't work for it. Um, but we are saying that the tools are applicable to the human experiences that everyone goes through. Um, so if someone gets into a true rest that works for them, and, and it's just, it, they just feel so good about it. They want everyone to do it. The other, and I think that's just a, about the power of true rest. The other um, part of that um, is that all the great religions of the world have within them ways that people get true rest. And when I got involved with Alcoholics Anonymous, and was sort of, because I came as, as an outsider, okay? I had inmates of prison who were getting something out of this, therefore I explored it. I didn't go into AA with any need of my own. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't have, yeah, it was, you know, uh, distant, etc. Um, so with true rest, we give ourselves the chance of being renewed and refreshed. The definition of true rest is, you know, it re uses to the point where we are happy to go back and face the responsibilities we have to face. 
those responsibility are awesome, then we are as happy as we could expect to be um, going back and facing the responsibilities we have to face. Now, bringing it, you know, that's a sort of revision of true rest. Um, bring that into uh, resistance to nourish and change is in fact really powerful because it's almost a tip off to resistance to nourish and change that we will sabotage our own uh, true rest activities. You know, we won't pursue them. And that's why, you know, it was meant as a joke, Mary, when Mary told me the title, I said, stop talking about me. Um, you know, because, you know, I, I sabotage some of my, some of the best ways I could get through rest, which are physical. You know, it's going into the park, walking, it's running, it's going to the swimming pool, it's going to the gym. Okay. A whole bunch of stuff is closed, but I've got a park. I've just got to walk across the road, um, and I can walk and jog in that park, um, and I don't do it. Uh, that's almost classic resistance to nourishing change, um, and that's where you know nourishing change is that thing we could do but won't, and we almost stubbornly won't. And that's where, and I talked earlier about the overlapping of the two, the overlapping between true rest and feelings of accomplishment. Um, there's a real um, overlapping between resistance to nourishing change and low goodwill. Okay. Um, they are in some ways almost synonymous, um, but it's coming at the thing from a slightly different angle. And of course, one of the things that true rest has in power, it, it's just positive, okay? You know, it's a place where we can come into issues, well, a strength and health first. So, you know, if, if someone's having a very hard time or something to say someone's, got lousy depression. Um, are they getting any true rest? What would it be like if they got true rest? And I tra trained a couple of doctors once and um, they went through a time where that was the prescription they would give their patients, true rest. <laughs> uh, I was quite proud of that. Um, yeah, but how many doctors ask the patients before they give them medication for depression, are you getting any what we call true rest? You know, nourishing activities around which you feel really good. Um, and what would it be like if you were getting them? So there's a there's also a place when resistance to nourishing change. is sort of pretty awful because it can be really awful. I mean, people, you know, all of us can get into resistance to nourishing change and, you know, you know, we'll look for conflict where we can find it and we'll create it, we'll create problems if there aren't a lot around. Um, yeah, resistance to nourishing change it's a sort of fairly nasty place. It brings out some of the nastiness in all of us. Um, and I think we almost don't want other people to do well because one of the ways at times you can see the uh, power of resistance to nourishing change, the power um, of low goodwill when someone sort of tries to prevent someone else from getting true rest, okay? Um, 
And you know, this is you know learning learning these tools and learning where they are and, and how to use them. And we come on with that not from a sort of diagnostic place, but from oh, it's more a place of this is what we have. This is a difference between this is what I have to handle with this person, resistance to nourish and change. Then there is a certain place where it sort of comes back on me. How am I handling this? Not, you know, that person is resistance to nourishing change and of course they'll be had to work with it horrible. Um, So it, 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 they're two tools that can really fit nicely together. And just to fill out the teaching on um, true re going back to true rest, because I do think it's one of um, uh, David's real points of uh, particular, uh, just the quality of his mind. Um, because he linked true rest in what we call addiction. He called it escapism, what you know, we call addiction or substance abuse. Dave called it escapism, that's the repelling word. And the way he put it is escapism is the other side of the coin to true rest. That's a, that's a particular powerful bit of thinking, David Bellman. Um, and he sort of pointed out that um, anything that becomes an addiction or what we would call substance abuse starts off as true rest. Um, you know, it starts off as the apple pie that comforting or the um, glass of whiskey after work that's relaxing. Um, you know, the drug that takes it. Cynthia. One thing that I've noticed um, with me, and I don't know if this has something to do with the escapism true rest route uh, discussion, um, but uh, and I, I notice now because playing games is usually playing role playing games is usually true rest for me, but it's been escapism here and there. But one thing I notice if I just say oh, you know, I'm having some true rest. I'm going to make myself, I'm going to get some true rest, or now I do in Japanese. I'm practicing my Japanese and allow it and fe uh, feelings of accomplishment for doing it. I actually don't get caught. I mean, I can stop and I don't get caught up in it forever. But it's, it's like when I start feeling guilty about doing it because I'm not doing something else, then I actually end up doing it. The more guilty I feel about it, the more I end up doing, which is, which makes no sense. But that's, but actually I was reading this in the Health at Every Size book too, when it comes to food, they're saying, if you're going to eat, you know, a pizza or chips or something, don't feel guilty about it. Just enjoy it. Because actually yeah. once you start, because you're actually going to be satisfied if you enjoy it, you'll be satisfied a lot faster than if you feel guilty. And if you feel guilty, you're never going to be satisfied. So you're just going to keep eating more. It seems counterintuitive, but I've noticed that seems to work if I just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because, well, I would say just enjoying it is sort of, how can I put it? Diluting or cutting out the resistance to nourishing change. Because the resistance to nourishing change is real complicated. Um, and I think we let go and say, okay, I'm just going to do this. 
it's an area in which I can uh, quite torture myself. You know, I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing enough. And I set myself a whole bunch of goals and I won't do them. And I do something that's sort of to arrest, but doesn't feel to arrest because I'm just, because I've set myself all these goals. And it was you, Nikki, who gave me the feedback years ago. You know, either, you know, just take the day off or work. Don't mix them. And, you know, that's one of those pieces of feedback that really, really helped me. Um, because I think resistance to marriage and change, we make it all really complicated, okay? It's almost more complicated than attraction to hurt or just, you know, it's something we could do. Yeah, you know, why are human beings are sort of self-defeating? I mean, we, we almost in, invented self-defeating behavior. Um, you know, we marry. Well, I was just thinking, the two most common phrases I experience when I'm, I'm experiencing resistance to true rest is I haven't got enough time or it's too much trouble. <laughs> it's too much trouble. Like in the newsletter I wrote about uh, swimming in my friend Emma's pool, which if I was closer and it was summer, don't actually have much resistance to nourishing change because you know, it's eight minutes away in a car and it's a beautiful view. And But go f further to the swimming pool where I'll be with strangers, where I've got to, where it'd be chlorine, where I'll have to uh, take a shower. And, and that even just talking about it makes me feel the mm. feeling of being wet and having to put my clothes on rather than the feeling of being in the water. So... And that's what happens when you try and teach people true rest. That they, they kind of can come up with, well, I haven't got the time to do that, even after they've yeah. learned that it really refreshes them. And it's puzzling. That it is puzzling. That's why I think, I mean, just putting those two things together, this discussion on this level, um, that attraction to hurt and resistance to nourishing change, which in some way are the same thing, in some way. Um, they, you know, they, they, they are mysteries. They are, um, you know, why do we do that? Um, and, you know, you could sort of ask that a whole lot of stuff, you know, you know, why did he do it? Whether well, it was, you know, driving a car that killed him or nearly, or nearly killed him, uh, you know, going to war, um, you know, becoming the most destructive nation. I mean, you know, the, the culture and the nation that produced Bach and Beethoven, <laughs> Good. Um, uh, you know, produced Hitler. Um, and, you know, why did they do it? And I, I, I think that, you know, fundamental existential question um, is, is the sort of level on which we work in power. You know, we're asking those issues. And, um, I, I certainly don't think there are any quick answers to them. Um, and I also don't think they're necessarily, this is where I'm, you know, feeling myself outside of the traditional um, academic professional strand as we've talked about other times. Because in those circumstances, someone's sort of got to come up with a reason. Um, rather than tools and, you know, bits of knowledge that we recognize must be incomplete. 
because the nature of human knowledge is incomplete. Um, the reason I'm putting all that in, I, I, I think it's useful to be able to face uh, the mystery of resistance to nourishing change, okay? Um, and not facing the mystery as well as the practicality, okay? Um, because I think otherwise it becomes a sort of self-improvement formula and you know they like diets they tend not to work um, they tend not to work um, um can you repeat uh, that again facing the mystery uh, and because i was trying to write that down and i and then i forgot half of it as i was writing facing the mystery and the I, i'm not sure if this is where i said it this is where i'm thinking it the mystery and the practicality. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Because, you know, why can't Peter get to the swimming pool? Why can't Peter walk across the road to the park? Um, you know, why can't Peter draw on all his positive memory links about physical activity? Um, now there's a challenge coming up for me. You know, it's going to be spring and it's going to be summer. Um, yeah. Um, and I think the way we can put, put the mystery in in an easy way, uh, because one of the ways I think we can say it is that a bit like you know who's attracted to who why is that why is that coupled together um and i think it can be i think i think we can have a similar uh, mystery about uh, our own caress other people's caress and how it really really works okay really, really well, there's no question that um, progress works. Do you want to come in, please? Yeah. Uh, let me take this someplace else now. In here, in the kitchen. Uh, Un momentito. Okay, I'm I'm really interested in what we're talking about, and um, Cynthia, when you were talking about how um, that, uh, just go ahead and enjoy it. Um, I think. That was a real key to me about some things that um, it just seems like if if I have this idea in my mind, I've got to get it all in, you know, whatever it is, whether it's food or whatever the thing is, I'm not really enjoying it. Uh, I'm just, somehow I have it in mind that I'll feel better, but it's not... Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not tasting it. I'm not feeling it, and so um, I just to do it to get it over with is, um, and then I'll be better, uh, or I'll feel better, uh, is kind of a a thought I have in my mind um, sometimes about things. Um, it's not even just about food or or liquids or anything, it um, can even be about exercising. 
that that's this onerous thing to get done. Um, and so now I have gotten a, a trainer at the local gym and we're going through it very slowly. And so I'm starting to feel, you know, what it feels like to move my muscles or to, or feel that they're stronger or, and, and she has a lot of positive reinforcement, of course, all the time. So it's not a matter of, oh, you were great, you had a great session, which she does say, but it was, it's also about the process. And I think, um, I know there are people that can go to extremes with exercise where, um, as an example, but I, I, think, I think that was a really good insight and um, I'm really looking at what I'm resisting. Is it like with the exercise? I'm not really, really ex resisting exercise. There's something in my mind that this is going to be a really horrible event, <laughs> which it is. And, but that's, that's what goes on in my head. Uh, or even things like uh, deep breathing, or I've just also you must never take this outside of the session. But Quaker meeting, I have a lot of trouble with Quaker meeting, sitting in silence, meditating. Ugh, I, I'm that part of Quakerism. I'm bad at. You know, I just like get me out of here. That what color are those curtains? Why'd she wear that hat? You know, the, things like. <laughs> could no you know like three or four minutes i'm okay but um i don't know i don't tell that to other quakers uh there's probably others but by the way do you want me to take that out yeah. and stop the recording while you're talking no, no. okay <laughs> don't think it's funny probably probably there's other people. i'm sure there's other people so um but it's just um i i need for me, I need something else besides, I mean, I'll still go to Quaker meeting, but I need some other kind of quieting um, method for myself. Something else that has the same effect, but um, I know that sounds, anyway, I'm not really clear on all this, uh, but I No, I think, I think it's a really important point. Um, I think, and I know you won't mind me saying this, Nikki, but I think that the feedback Nikki gave me, might either take the day off or work, but don't mix them up. And I think around true rest, there's a certain sort of toughness and ruthlessness we need. If something's not working for us, it's not working. Uh, just sort of and then we got to sort of search somewhere else it's mm -hmm. not saying well I should persevere with I mean true true rest me you know getting into it you mm -hmm. know might might need some um, uh, might need some discipline at times we might hit bumps um, you know, where it doesn't work for us. But, it, you know, it, it very much relates to the triangle and, and accepted and rejected efforts, just to bring in those tools. Mm -hmm. um, now, if true rest is not working, I, I, I think we need to be tough enough to say, okay, you know, that's an activity that's good for me, that's an activity that's good for other people, but for me, it is not true rest. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, going going back to um, it's over there, um, you know, going back to the wheel of change, sort of sharing that with somebody, uh, and being able to say, um, uh, yeah, because I've, I've got the idea of getting a bicycle and riding the bicycle around the park. Um, which a lot of people do, it's easy to do. Um, but if I try it and it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know. 
maybe it's a good thing for fitness and I might pursue it that way. I don't, yeah, going to the gym will never be true rest for me. I know that it's a sort of activity, okay? And mm -hmm. I can tell that. I mean, you, you, you've only got to look around any gym. And <laughs> this is where I live, it's a small town. It's a small gym, there are not a lot of people there. Um, but you can see some people for whom, wow, this is true rest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe true rest is sort of something about being comfortable, being at home, uh, some sort of easy, uh, something enthralling at times. Re I get a whole lot. Yeah, the true rest I am getting is reading. Uh, and I think the way I've got true rest out of reading over the last, you know, not sh not short period of time, you know, over the last four or five years, I, I think it's been crucial for me, just crucial. Um, and that has within it the, um, I don't want to say seeds, um, the seeds have a sort of inevitability to them. That has the danger of becoming escapism or addiction. I mean, I can read to the point where I'm running away from my life, okay? I can get absolutely enthralled. Um, and I know that the program in Italy, and this is going back to the time you were there, Cecil, I, I had a big, li a big library. Um, and someone arrived and said, took me aside and said, Peter, would you mind if you took all the science fiction books and put them in a box and put them out of there? You know, mm. I had serious problems with science, with an addiction to science fiction. Mm. And I guess that that was a time before computer games, okay? So I guess computer games, uh, for some people are true wrestling, for some people are addiction. So, sort of coming back to it, I think we've got to be, see, so I think we've got to be able to sort of chuck it out mm -hmm. as true rest, okay, as true rest. And then we have, <laughs> I think we've got to face that maybe there's a lack there. Okay, I've got to find some true rest somewhere else when it's a search. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. There's that expectation. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off, Cynthia. Yeah, there's some expectation, and I gotta let go of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cynthia. Um, actually, before uh, Cease, I was a Quaker. My spouse is still a Quaker. I was a Quaker for about a year or so, but then I found another path. Um, and. I, this, what's hold on? I don't know what just happened. Um, anyways, oh, oh, I think I might have tripped off my uh, my Alexa on my uh, on my tablet for somehow. <laughs> yes, that's sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's hard sitting through all that, I, and you're not the only one. In fact, they used to joke about you know well, you been a Quaker longer than me so you know it's like yeah there's ways of doing silence and, uh, I guess I'm not talking anyways the thing is is when I was talking about um, uh, one of the things that I've done and I don't know if this is good or not but it, it's been helping me to keep my game playing as true rest rather than um, an addiction is to make sure to get a feeling of accomplishment by something productive before I play. Like I want to go play and I think, okay, well, before I go play, I'm going to at least do this and this, and it might even be a small thing and then let that be a reward. And then I, I'm usually good at it just being true rest and not getting, you know, mm -hmm. because once yeah. it becomes an addiction, it's not fun anymore. Yeah. It's like a compulsion. Yeah. I've noticed. I did something similar to what for me. Um, uh, 
uh, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do that task, and then, mm -hmm. and and then I'll go into the reading. If I start with a reading, it's a bit. It can be a bit of a slippery slope. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I had my phone. I have a friend who's going into the hospital later today. I'm sorry. Let me just turn this off. I don't know how to do that. I'm sorry. Do you want to come in on this one, Nikki? Um, no, I was, I was just, I'm still thinking back a while to when you, to just the true rest bit about, I kind of, I know I've heard you say, oh, my alarm's going off now. Um, oh, hold on, sorry. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> oh, no. I was, I'll, thinking, I'll, I was thinking we were having off. a little series of technological interruptions. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> we just need to mute ourselves, don't we, at that time? Just mute yourself, see? So that'll work. It's hard when you're talking, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's a new phone, and I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, new phones. Hi, sorry, <laughs> I came back. Okay. Um, <laughs> dear. Um, and I've heard you say before about, uh, y y you know, everybody, it's about finding your own and everything, but I, I don't know, I don't know, it just sort of struck me more about the clarity, because I think I've, al I've always done with that, I think, I'm just thinking about it, I've always, I thought, yeah, but my ones that I've got, Obviously, those ones are the same for everybody as well. <laughs> it's just that other people have got extra ones that I don't have. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, you know, so then when you said, you know, washing dishes and going swimming, I'm like, oh, ridiculous. And then contrast today, here, here we are, you know, we've had this bitter icy weather last week. And it had been nothing but grey and rainy and mud everywhere the week, a couple of weeks before. And then it just turned cold as well. And it just, the world was shutting down more and more. And then today, it brightened up a bit and I was out. And actually, I took my coat off and then I took my fleece off as well. And I actually had bare arms for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind of feeling that combination of sun and breeze on my skin and whilst I knew I'm like oh that's amazing I really like that and I remember having that feeling before it's only with you talking about true rest me thinking actually that might be a thing of mine that combination of sun and breeze on my skin when I think of it's like no wonder I like outdoor coffee shops and mm. how it changes my life just when spring comes and I can you know, the earliest possible opportunity, just find some sort of slightly sheltered position in where it's outdoor. And I really think it's that combination of sun and a breeze. And then the other one I know of is green grass underfoot and blue sky above. I've known that for a number of years, but that, I re that just makes me happy. And then that explains again last week that literally everywhere that should be grass is now mud because everybody is out the minute it stopped raining for a minute everybody was out walking in parks so every everything's just all plowed up it looks everything looks like a field by a gate where the cows have been standing um and it's just oh so depressing so it's, it's, the, it's, it's like deprivation of these little crumbs of t true rest that I can get and the world's just shut them all off. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. And the memory links go back all the way, Nikki, with those two. Those yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's right. Because everything, for me, I didn't enjoy being at 
home at all and um, literally being outdoors. Yeah, well, I think I won't have even realised, but I will have been out kind of in all weathers. I lived in Scotland from the age of six till nine. That's not famous for sunny weather. Um, but I never noticed I was definitely out in the woods. Um, and the other thing, you know, happy dogs, watching happy dogs, which is, I guess, the London equivalent of happy farm animals that I that I had access to from when I was 10. Um, because dogs look really happy when they're happy, happier than a cow standing there. <laughs> <laughs> they just look mildly contented. Oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It'll, it's um, set early. And, okay, all I did is manage to snooze this thing. I'll silence myself again. Thank you. There is Mary, sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to follow on from what Nikki said because I was thinking about one of the ways I get myself to go on the balcony here is uh, exactly what Nikki said, uh, but as the sound of the sea. You know, mm. I, say, I say to myself, if I go out, well, I, look, I don't try when it's not sunny, but if I go out when it's sunny, I'll feel the breeze and I'll hear the sea as, and feel the sun. And I was thinking about how that can, though that there's something, uh, for me at least, about the sensory aspect, because my special one I like about being in water is um, swimming not in an expert way where my head goes under, but swimming so I can see the sunlight in an outdoor pool, see the sunlight on the water. And there's something about capturing that sensory image and the first one I said of what I'll feel if I go on the balcony that I find very um, magnetic to help me do it. That there's something about kind of in my body remembering what that sensory experience is. It kind of helps me go and take the trouble to open the door and go on the balcony. I can't do the swimming one right now. But um, I just wondered if that was helpful because it seems it's almost like it short circuits the resistance part because it uh, rehearse almost the anticipate the, what the true rest feeling is going to be like. That was all I wanted to contribute. Please. Well, I was going to add one more thing about the Quaker thing Cynthia was talking about. Uh, there is something called the Association of Bad Friends on Facebook. And <laughs> my spouse is part of that. <laughs> well, yes. Okay. So what this is, when I started, there were like 500 people. Now there's like 10,000 Quakers on this. And we just make so much fun of things that Quakers do. We just... And we just keep going, you know, somebody starts a little thing and then everybody adds crazy stuff to it. You, you can't make it mean or anything, but you can make it almost up to that point, you know, where it's, <laughs> and it's hilarious. And it lets go of a lot of what I was talking about, of uh, that feeling that Quakers have to be so serious and, oh my God, they're not, you know, in their minds. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so, so humor is a good, good release when we're taking ourselves, I guess, too seriously on any subject. And, and that really helps me a lot uh, to go on there and, and feel like there is this other side to Quakerism where it's very much about social action and being the good person and and doing the right thing, and, and not only doing the right thing, but doing way over the right thing. Uh, so, um, so it's nice to have this release valve that, that's so harmless, so. I, I really appreciate that. I, yeah, I really appreciate that example. Mm -hmm. uh, from children to old men who were telling dirty jokes. <laughs> Italy is full of jokes against the Pope. 
you know, I just fall over, fall over the place. Um, anyway, that really touched me, Cease. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I, I think it does, it touches both these themes of today because it touches true rest because in the humor we can sort of let go um mm -hmm. and yes yeah, cynthia well i was going to say just in and just in general like when i've been a lawyer and astrologer and when i've seen uh you know some of the better clergy your myself. volume's way down oh i'm sorry uh when i was a lawyer and um and even as an astrologer and now uh and when my spouse was a pastor before she was a quaker um i've always found those professionals that didn't take themselves too seriously were the better ones <laughs> you know the ones who like took themselves really seriously just <laughs> that there's a certain amount of of humor like you know one of the jokes among astrologers i think i've told about is uh you know um well the two two jokes we have about that is is that the therapeutic blaming of the planets and two there's sort of an and i do it too an astrologer uh, objectively bad but an astrologer good when you predict something bad's going to happen and it does <laughs> so you know it's like you, you, it's bad but it's like oh look it's all lined up and it was supposed to be bad <laughs> and I, you know it's so, and I don't think it's like, it, it, it might be attraction to hurt, but there's just something about it that, uh, that, but being able, I think being able to laugh at yourself really, uh, and that's, I think really keeps you honest as a professional or an, as, or a spiritual person as whatever you're doing. And it, it all over the place when, you know, when Barack Obama says, well, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm scared of Michelle, but I'm really scared of Sasha. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, there's just something. Um, I, I I think true rest can has to have some lightness to it, otherwise it won't work. Um, it doesn't mean at times we don't need. You know, I've got to get there, right? I've got to make myself go out the door and go over to the park, but um, in, in, it's, it's, it's got to have some give and take lightness to it. Well, we haven't really done the things that we write about. We're usually just making up stuff. So, <laughs> um, so we can let our fantasies really take us away. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's fun. There's certain restrictions. You can't be mean uh, to other people uh, or, you know, tell lies or anything like that. But other than that, you got pretty much free reign. And I think that kind of freedom helps us, like you were saying, Peter, be better people mm -hmm. when we uh, let no, it's you're in a safe environment in a way because you will they won't they won't put it up if it's bad or mean spirited. Yeah. So you're um so there is some safety there to have fun and to um to release the tension of being a good Quaker. And um it's pretty hard. <laughs> and so so I think there's that's probably a need with a lot of things to have these fun things to do that relieve the stress of being this perfect, wonderful, kind person. Uh, or whatever view we have of ourselves, or, you know. So that seems like a, a rest from ourselves in a way. A rest well, from... Yeah, one of the things... Um... I, I was really pleased about them. I, I should have done it more often, or maybe it was something that couldn't have been done more often. But we used to do art in Italy, way back, program there. We used to do art therapy, so we had these big sheets of butcher's paper we got from the butcher. Um, and, I'm, and I put, I don't know if you, if when you were there, Cecil, or not, but I put a big 
piece of butcher paper up on the wall and people could write on it what were they doing when they should have been passive listening okay <laughs> and people could do it anonymously <laughs> so, you know all sorts of things come up um yeah i think i i think there's a real well in terms of it it, it almost sort of relates to um the material around purpose just to bring that in for a moment if we've got purpose if we've got a sustaining purpose we sure as hell need to be irreverent about it otherwise that's what cults are cults are when you can mm. uh, enclose systems and you know mm. system professional I'll keep it ambiguous this time so you won't have to worry about um not recording it Cynthia but professional groups become closed systems and you and they um they hold themselves back by the little mm -hmm. possibility of doing damage mm -hmm. uh, but yeah it's what we had it was um joe biden quoted his wife um Dr. Joe Biden, uh, when he said what she does is, we, it's okay if we take what we are doing seriously. What we are doing is a serious activity, but it's dangerous if we take ourselves too seriously. Mm -hmm. I feel that's a you know, powerful um, distinction. Mary. Well, I just found myself thinking that I don't know how much it adds. I was just thinking that people who can't, who take themselves too seriously, are rarely transparent, and people yeah. who can laugh at themselves or, <laughs> or their association, you know, professional or Quaker, um, are also being transparent in the process. Yeah. yeah. Saying human foibles and mistakes and weaknesses and. Yeah. I think you're right, and I also think it is. Um, I think it is. Um, you know, in terms of our tools, it's a that irreverence. I think is, you know, a way into the caring life business. A way into it almost leapfrogs, if that's an expression out of the performance life force so you know claiming a bit of humanity about it um, and yeah and I, I you know i guess our argument is that what is commonly called humanity to a funny use of the word really because humans are evil part of humanity too but the way that word is used um it's, it's caring my thoughts and it's crucial and you see it in you know the example i used about you know barack obama saying is the person he's really scared of is his youngest daughter and i could really identify with us no, no it's not my youngest daughter it's my oldest daughter <laughs> my daughter Danae. Yeah. Uh, when she says something, you listen. <laughs> it gets us something, doesn't it? It gets us something. Um, and I think that looseness gives us a chance of looking at our resistance to nourishing change because. When I said, you know, resistance to nourishing change can in a fun way. I think there's some way that with resistance to nourishing change, we are being asked to look at a part of ourselves we do not look at. Um, and then within that, I think we 
peel our backs to the wall and then we get nasty almost like that metaphor of a, uh, you know a scared wolf will come after you um and it just get tighter and tighter and i saw that happen in um, um in residential programs uh, and, and i also think it happens with sort of professional ones uh, and yeah if we can Um, there needs to be uh, an association of bad progressive Democrats, okay? <laughs> if they could laugh at themselves, it could make, make the country. So once again, the Quakers are leading the way yes. because they sure as hell would take themselves seriously when they were just about the first abolitionists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that way. My spouse will sometimes read me stuff from the Association for Bad Friends. <laughs> Say again. My spouse, yes, if there's something particularly funny, she'll either send it to me or read something from it. <laughs> to me. Yeah, yeah. Association of bad talent practitioners. <laughs> we we don't we need a bigger group. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> It does, it does feel good to have a way to laugh at ourselves, though, and take them. And politically, it can be enormously powerful. Enormously powerful. Because it's almost a... You know, if you can, it's the other side of humor that if you can effectively ridicule someone, you can wipe them out politically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the power of humor comes in in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't make fun of anybody else. Just no, no, I know that. I know that. I'm, well, all I'm saying there is. I think the power of humor is worthwhile looking at in a number of different sides. The, mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, uh, you know, cutting hard, hard humiliating is embarrassing someone mm -hmm. in a political debate is just another. That's not right <laughs> in any shape or form. It just sort of how powerful humor is, and if humor is a powerful force, um, is it relevant to resistance to nourishing change? Mm -hmm. And certainly, because I think one of the things in resistance to nourishing change, the, one of the things that happens there is we're taking it so very seriously. And we've got the answer. Um, yeah. And I think it, one of the other things it gets at, I think, is that. Um, yeah, true rest has got to be fun. Some part of it's got to be a deep, accepted effort to bring in that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, it's just got to be fun in some form. Can I come in, Mary, with more around this? Yeah, I'm fine. I've made the points as they came up for me. 
Don't have no. anything at the moment. I, I think I, I think both resistance to nourishing change, just in finishing up, I think one of the, because they're both very powerful forces. Um, yeah, one, one, one of the things, and you know, we're putting the connection here to um, uh, true rest. But one of the things in resistance to nourishing change, there was a real sort of defensiveness. Um, uh, digression, digressing, you know, wanting to change topics among wind documents. Um, and Uh, and as I said, and it's almost a, uh, you know, we have every use of work in Pelham, but it's almost a technique to be able to perceive when someone is sabotaging their own true rest or sabotaging someone else's true rest. Is, is almost a tip off, well, certainly a tip off to low goodwill, and, when, and it's almost a tip off to resistance to nourishing change. Um, Cynthia. Um, I think two things. I don't know if it's related to resistance or not, but I know one of the ways that I, I have, and it's changed ever since I've actually learning about these things in Pelin has helped, but one of the ways that I both sabotage true rest um, and sabotage things like feelings of accomplishment is starting to put too much pressure on myself. Like one of the things that you is, is still true rest. It's a little hard now because I got a kitten who chases yarn was knitting and crocheting. But then I would get into this thing where I had to make all this stuff and it wasn't true rest anymore. And it, it, it became a, a pressured activity that I, yeah. you know, and, and, but I think it's because I think I had a really hard time, um, just accepting that uh, and I'm you know that true rest and even like playing games I get into this thing like like right now which is okay I, I I'm deciding I want to do every dragon quest game in order and and stuff like that which is kind of fun but um but I think that pressure um is not it, it, I think that 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 does establish that and learning to accept uh, protect, uh, accept it, uh, well, protect accepted efforts and learning that true rest has value in and of itself sort of cuts out that whole pressure. It's like, no, I'm not wasting time. I'm getting some true rest. Yeah. <laughs> and Yeah, I, I know something I wanted to present here and I sort of forgot the theme, but we're stopping a minute, but I'll keep it brief. I, I think one of the ways that Helen works generally um, sort of almost basic is that often provides a framework and a really sort of tight theoretical structure for some something someone already knows and already does okay um, and within that and I think true rest is a really good example of that I, I think within that there's a real power um, I mean, you know, you can observe people who are, uh, you know, doing very well in the world and obviously have some ways to get through rest. They just do. Uh, they've never heard of us. So, and I think that particular function, particularly with true rest, um, you know, resistance nourishing change is complicated. I'm putting that aside for a minute. But just staying with true rest, I think it's a way that people can go, oh, that's what it is. Yeah, that's what's working for me. Okay, we'll stop there. 
Um, thank you for coming. See you on Sunday. And um, I'm in Norfolk and it's dark and I'm looking forward to the day when at this time of night it's light. Okay. <laughs> um, Just to let you know, Peter, Elizabeth had to leave because she was hurting. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Do you want to go next, Mary? Sure. I'm Mary in Rosarito Beach, and it's um, half past 11 in the morning with the rest of the day to look forward to. Is that everything? Yes. <laughs> Nikki? I'm Nikki in Wimbledon, 7.30, cold and dark. <laughs> Cease? Um, Stace in Tampa, Florida, and it is almost 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Cynthia? Uh, I'm Cynthia, I'm in Kankakee, Illinois, and it's 1.30, and after this I'm going to go have a little bit of lunch and have some true rest and uh, finish the, uh, and, and going into the final castle of <laughs> the game I'm playing. Okay, <laughs> okay. well, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.